the book of Exodus chapter 12, verse 14. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to Yahweh throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. All right, I want to give all praises, honor, and glory to Yahweh, Bahasham Yahweh Shai, Bahasham Rachachwidash. Okay, Yahweh is the true name of the Heavenly Father and the Holy Tongue. Yahweh Shai is the true name of the King and Savior of Israel. And Rachachwidash is the Holy Spirit, which is the Comforter. Double honest to the apostles and elders of Great Millstone for leading by example in these last days. And Shalom to the hopeful elect, all you Akim making your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, this lesson is going to be called why don't christians celebrate the passover or any holy day in the bible for that matter all right we just had the passover this week and uh there was a beautiful observance um you had brothers from all over the state of louisiana and even parts of mississippi that came down to partake of this this holy day man the most holy day of the year and you know it was a beautiful celebration and and the camaraderie and the brotherhood and the room was just it, it was beautiful and it was it was palpable you could feel the actual true love the brothers have for one another because we're all joined in one mind. We were all there, um, brothers that, that labor in this word, that truly believe on the sacrifice that Yahweh Shai made, that truly believe in the words of the Heavenly Father. And just being in a room full of like-minded people, um, all celebrating the same uh, past, really the past, present, and future of our nation, it, it was a beautiful thing. And I couldn't help but think like, you know, why don't Christians celebrate this? And the answer is obvious, okay? The, the real reason, which we know, those of us that read the scriptures, you know that, that the Christians in the Bible were Israelites that followed the Messiah, all right? We were first called Christians in Antioch, all right? Those were the men that, that followed the Messiah, uh, aside from the, the Israelites in Judea that didn't, okay? Those were being called Jews. Jew is a byword. Christian is a byword. But Jews and, and Christians in the New Testament, they were all Israelites. But that's another lesson. The point is, these modern-day Christians, people that are called Christians today, they don't celebrate the scriptures. They don't celebrate the holy days. They don't observe uh, the law, statutes, and commandments. They don't even keep the Sabbath. Why is that? So this lesson, we're just going to get into some reasons why the Passover in and of itself proves emphatically that, number one, the Most High is racist. Okay, He has a preferred race of people, which is Israel. Number two, his only begotten son doesn't love everyone. All right, he's a, he has favorites just like his father. Number three, the followers of the Messiah are commanded to keep the holy days in the Bible, starting with the Passover. And number four, that America is the new Egypt and it's going to be destroyed just like ancient Egypt. And we're supposed, to, we're supposed to patiently wait on that day. All four of these points completely contradict the core tenets of Christianity, which has absolutely nothing to do with the Holy Scriptures. All right. Christianity is, is a completely just perverse form of paganism and idolatry that was really concocted by the Roman Catholic Church and pushed onto the masses of people. And since the majority of people don't read, they actually think that the holidays of Christianity have something to do with our Lord and Savior. And, you know, scriptures tell you in Revelation, the first chapter and the third verse, blessed is he that readeth. Okay, the majority of people don't read. So what? They're not blessed. All right, but we're going to get into the scriptures as we do here at Great Millstone. And we're going to prove that the, the Messiah uh, kept the Passover. The Messiah commanded his disciples to keep the Passover. Uh, the apostles kept the Passover after the Messiah resurrected. So all of this nonsense about the the ordinances, uh, the holy days were nailed to the cross. We don't have to keep them anymore. That's all a complete mangling of scripture. And we're going to prove emphatically that, yes, you are supposed to keep the Passover if you are a true believer. And if you're not a true believer, you're not supposed to partake in the Passover. So without further ado, let's get into some scripture. This is the book of Job, chapter 34, verse 29. When he giveth quietness, who then can make trouble? And when he hideth his face, who then can behold him, whether it be done against a nation or against a man only? that the hypocrite reign not, lest the people be ensnared. Let me read that again. Whether it be done against a nation or against a man only, that the hypocrite reign not, lest the people be ensnared. Right, so we see here in the Holy Scriptures that the Heavenly Father judges entire nations of people. He can judge a man individually or he can judge a nation. And there's no greater example in that than ancient Egypt, what the Most High did to the Egyptians that had the Israelites in captivity. All right, that was an epic uh, example of racial hatred, man. The, the Heavenly Father showed preference to his chosen people, and he completely destroyed another race of people, man. That was, that's race, that's clearly racism, okay? You have the race of Israel, you have the race 
of Matazarium, which is uh, would be Egyptian and the English, but the word Egypt means double straits in the Hebrew. Okay, it also means uh, slavery in the Greek. All right, but basically that was a race of people, the sons of Ham. Uh, they had the, the Israelites in slavery for about 400 years, which a lot of people take that to mean um, we're going to be delivered this year because this is the 400 year anniversary. No, that that prophecy was dealing with ancient Egypt. We were in Egypt for 430 years, but uh, the first 30 years we weren't really in slavery like that. But that's another lesson. Basically, when you deal with the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Yahweh, the the King of Terrors, man, you're dealing with a God that judges nations of people, and that's all throughout the scriptures. But we want to get a get more specific. This is the book of Exodus, chapter 12, verse 29. And it came to pass that at midnight, Yahweh smote all of the firstborn. Yahweh smote all of the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt for there was not a house where there was not one dead man if that <laughs> I, I don't even like what do you what do you say about that for all of you people let's say god loves everybody or or uh saint john 3 and 16 is talking about god so loved the world that world means everybody no the the world in john 3 16 is talking about the cosmos the elect of the nation of israel the israel of the most high all right there's a cosmos within a cosmos all right but again, that's another lesson. Um, I did a lesson called uh, Understanding John 3.16 to go further into that. And it actually goes back into Exodus, which, again, that's all expounded in that lesson. But right now, I just wanted to point out the fact that the Most High smote, well, the word smote means kill. He killed the firstborn of all the Egyptians. And it says here specifically, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon. Because right now... You have this argument, now that everyone knows who the Israelites are, they, they come across the truth, they come across the videos, or they might walk, walk past a camp in person, they'll say, well, yeah, you know, the white man, he did all these horrible things to you, but it wasn't all of us. It, we didn't, I, I didn't, I never owned any slaves. My family didn't own slaves. It was only 1% of white people that owned slaves. All, all of this madness, you know, Esau is trying to wiggle out of his judgment. And one of the, the really sorry, pathetic arguments that he uses is that, only a small percentage of so-called white people own Negro slaves. But when you go into the scriptures, the Most High didn't just punish Pharaoh. He punished Pharaoh and all of the Egyptians. Why? Because they were all the same people. All right, when you go into the scriptures, mountains represent governments. Hills represent small governments. When you have a mountain of people, when you have a, a, a race of people ruling over another race of people, it doesn't matter that the low-level people that are in rulership don't physically own slaves. That's never mattered. That's never happened in history. All right, all throughout history, anytime one race of people is ruling, you have a, a higher ruling class, but you also have lower level members of that same race. And the Most High judges all races together as a nation, because why? You, you come from the same seed, all right? You are the seed of a man. Every man, every uh, man, woman, and child, really every animal, every plant, every living creature comes from the seed okay when when the lord created everything it tells you that uh, everything was created with a seed to replenish itself all right so when you see an edomite he descends from esau edom okay he's not just a random see this society teaches you that everybody is their own personal island um there's no real community there's no real sense of, of racial pride or, or patriotism the root word patriot goes back to patriarch all right the, a true patriot is someone that loves his race, not not a country, all right? not a corporation, not a flag, but an actual extended family. That's what a race is. A race is an extended family that go back to a common uh, a progenitor, man. So here we have the Heavenly Father who has a chosen people, which our progenitor is Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, and we were in captivity under the Egyptians, all right, which were sons of Ham. So Again, going back to Job, the Most High can inflict judgment on a nation of people or on an individual or both, sometimes both. You have uh, the nation of Israel, for example. The, all of us came up under the curses, even though there were certain Israelites that were righteous, certain Israelites that were prophets, kings, certain Israelites that feared the Lord, we all went into slavery together. Likewise, you have heathen that don't necessarily own slaves, but they benefit from the general uh, 
captivity of the Israelites. Every every heathen on the planet Earth right now is reaping the benefits of the destruction of the nation of Israel. So they're all going into slavery, and it makes perfect sense. Now, this is the book of Numbers, chapter 8, verse 17. For all the firstborn of the sons of Israel are mine, both man and beast. On the day that I smote every firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified them for myself. Right, so the nation of Israel was made holy. The word holy means to separate, to sever completely, to remove, okay? The Heavenly Father sanctified the nation of Israel by killing the firstborn of the Egyptians, man. That's, that is an act of ethnic cleansing. That is a racial war, okay? The Heavenly Father is extremely racist, and that's clearly all throughout the scriptures. So, again, the observance of the Passover is an observance of an extremely racist act committed by a racist god okay there's no way of getting around that you can you can go to seminary school you can go to wikipedia you can go to uh one of these bible websites and try to mangle the scriptures to fit a narrative of christianity but what you're not going to do is actually go into the bible and see this god loves everybody narrative that people are trying to push and mainly they're trying to put it push it on our people to keep our people in a docile state of loving everyone because as long as the nation of israel stays cooning stays love in America, this economy, this society is going to continue and flourish. But as as the Heavenly Father has his remnant, as we're waking up out of this madness, you can clearly see that the Most High is about to destroy this place, just like he did ancient Egypt. So, uh, Lord willing, that was edifying. I want to move to the next point. This is, uh, oh yeah, we're going to prove that Yahweh Shai, who the world ignorantly calls Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, he commanded his disciples to keep the Passover. Now, this, this further proves that the so-called Old Testament is not done away with. The Most High and his son never did away with the Old Testament. That's, you know, he did away with the, the actual covenant, the contract. We broke it, so he was like, look, I, I can't even look at y'all anymore. But he never did away with the laws, okay? The Heavenly Father gave law to man prior to the nation of Israel even existing, okay? Abraham had the law, and it was oral. That's how he knew uh, to pay tithes, man. Adam had the law, and it was nor it was uh, oral. His sons had the law. That's how they, they knew what to sacrifice and what not to sacrifice. The law has always been here, and it's always going to be here. The law is forever. The law endureth forever. It tells you that in Baruch. But let's just prove that right quick. This is St. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. Now, this is in red letters. This is Yahweh Shai Mashiach speaking in the first person. All right? This isn't anything that could be misconstrued or taken out of context. This is red letters. Yahweh Shai telling you what it is in first person. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. Okay, the so-called Old Testament, what we call today, back then it was called the law and the prophets. All right, the books from Genesis all the way up into the Apocrypha. All right, it didn't stop in Malachi. The Apocrypha is part of the so-called Old Testament. That was referred to as the law and the prophets. Okay, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, this scripture plainly and clearly tells you that the Messiah did not do away with the commandments of his father. But what so-called modern-day Christians do, what they, they'll take the scripture and say, well, look, he, the word fulfill means this, the word fulfill means that. I've heard modern-day Christians use this scripture, which clearly tells you that the law is not done away with, and they'll redefine the word fulfill to mean any number of things, which he's clearly telling you that he claimed to fulfill the law and the prophets. What do the prophets say? The prophets all describe of a Messiah coming back to put the heathen in captivity and put the Israelites back in power in an everlasting rulership, but also to make us perfect, to put the laws in our inward parts, which again, the new covenant includes the law being placed in our inward parts. So how could the law be done away with? The new covenant includes the law. That in itself tells you that the law is forever. So if the kingdom of heaven is forever, Yahweh Shai's kingdom, his father's kingdom, if it's gonna be forever, and it includes a new covenant in which the Israelites are going to keep the laws forever, then that in and of itself means that the law is never going to be done away with. But just in case you, you don't get it from reading uh, Yahweh Shai's words in this verse, all you have to do is read the very next verse, and it tells you what the word fulfill means. It doesn't, you can't pervert the scriptures to someone that actually reads the Bible. Again, Revelation 1 verse 3, blessed is he that readeth. You can't be fooled if you actually read this scripture yourself. All you have to do is read the 18th verse, and it breaks down the 17th verse. So let's get it. Matthew 5, verse 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law 
to all be fulfilled. Now, the question you have to ask yourself, if you're part of a, a so-called church that's teaching that the commandments were done away with, the law was nailed to the cross, we don't have to keep this law anymore. We don't have to keep that law anymore. This is in red letters. He's saying not one jot or one tittle shall pass away from the law until it all is fulfilled. So has every prophecy in the Old Testament been fulfilled? Has every prophecy in the book of Isaiah been fulfilled? Are we in the kingdom of heaven right now? Is King David ruling on the throne right now? Have the 12 tribes of Israel repented and come back to the Father right now? Have the laws been placed into the hearts of the children of Israel? Are all of the nations bowing down unto the Israelites right now? Absolutely not, man. That's ridiculous. So the earth still exists. The sky still exists. The sun, moon, and stars, all of these things still exist. So what? The law has not been done away with, and it never will be. So part of the law is to keep the holy days of the scriptures, man, starting with the Passover. So if you call yourself believing in the Bible, how is it you don't keep the most important holy day in the Bible, which is the Passover? How is that possible? Because you don't read the scripture. You don't believe in Yahweh Bashem, Yahweh Shai. You don't believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You don't believe in the promises. You don't believe in the covenants. You're, you're an actor. You're a hypocrite. You're going through the motions. You might be going to church because your mom made you go to church or your woman dragged you to church or everyone around you goes to church. So you go to, you don't really believe. If you really believe and read the scriptures, you would have to come to the conclusion that you're supposed to keep the commandments. You're supposed to keep the faith in Yahweh Shai Mashiach and you're supposed to rehearse the righteous acts, which includes the holy days, such as the Passover. All right, now we're going to give you another account of Yahweh Shai uh, directly telling his disciples that they're to keep the Passover, man. We're going to read it. This is St. Matthew chapter 26, uh, verse 26. And as they were eating, Yahawashai took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. Right now, this scripture proves that the kingdom of heaven is going to be on earth. It also proves that we're going to be in earthly tabernacles. Uh, even after we get our spiritual power, we're going to be in bodies that, that can enjoy the pleasures of man, the glory of man. Uh, part of that includes eating, drinking, sex. Because you have a lot of people that are, that are teaching that there's not going to be sex in the kingdom of heaven. The scripture clearly proves to you that the Messiah is going to be eating and drinking with us in the kingdom. We're going to have bodies. We're not that scripture where he says um, we're going to be as the angels and we're not going to be given into marriage. That's talking about in the spirit world. That's not talking about when we come down, when New Jerusalem comes back down on the earth. We're not going to come back down and just be floating around, man. We're going to enjoy the earth, man. That's a very big part of prophecy. These scriptures, all, all kind of scriptures tell you how we're going to be multiplying, how we're going to be uh, enjoying the things of the earth all right but that's another lesson this is first corinthians chapter 11 and 24 and when they had given thanks he break it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me now the reason i'm reading this after the matthew is because depending on which bible you have this uh this portion of first corinthians the 11th chapter is in red letters this is actually how was shy mashiach talking he's speaking in the spirit through apostle paul who is is speaking directly to the Gentiles, the scattered Israelites that are learning of the Messiah, that are learning of their Israelite heritage, that are that have been aliens from the Commonwealth of Israel, they're being joined back unto the Messiah. All right, now, again, this is these are the words of Yahweh Shai. Listen very carefully to what he says. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, "This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me." For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Right, this is very serious. And again, this is Yahweh Shai speaking in the spirit through Apostle Paul. And he's telling the followers directly that from now on, when you keep the Passover, when you drink that wine, the wine represents the blood of the New Testament. Yahweh Shai's blood that he shed. He's the perpetual sacrifice for the nation of Israel. We're now under the order of Melchizedek because we can't sacrifice animals, we don't have the Levitical priesthood anymore. We don't even have a temple anymore, a physical temple. All right, the Lord's building that third temple right now, which is spiritual. But basically, the bread represents the body of Yahweh Shai Mashiach, and the wine, again, represents his blood. So 
how can you how can you celebrate these things if you don't observe the Passover every year? This is clearly a commandment to not only are you supposed to keep the Passover as the Heavenly Father commanded us to keep the Passover, but now we're supposed to keep the Passover in remembrance of Yahweh Shai and his sacrifice. So the Passover represents physically, physically the nation of Israel being delivered from our captivity in Egypt and the Egyptians being put to death, again, uh, an act of racial genocide, also spiritually represents the blood and the sacrifice of Yahweh Shai Mashiach, which is going to precede the new physical deliverance of Israel out of the new Egypt. Okay, so if you don't celebrate the Passover, that means not only do you not believe in the commandments of the Father, you don't believe in the commandments of the Son, and you don't observe the blood that he shed. You don't observe the blood of the New Testament, man. This is a very straightforward and, and bold commandment that so-called modern-day Christians completely ignore, like the rest of the Bible. All right, but um, let me just keep reading right quick because this goes into another point. This is verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So you see here, not only is the Heavenly Father extremely choosy, he has one chosen nation out of 18 nations, but his son is choosy also. If you're an Israelite, just because you're an Israelite doesn't mean that you're going to be saved. It doesn't mean that you believe. Within the nation of Israel, there are Israelites that know of the Passover, and the Lord is saying, if you partake of that Passover unworthily, you're guilty of killing the Messiah, man. That's extremely serious. So this doctrine that, that God loves everybody or, or holidays are supposed to be celebrated for, by everybody, everybody's supposed to come together and just, you know, get along and love each other. No, the scriptures tell you that the Passover is a solemn assembly. This is deadly serious. So if you're partaking in the Passover and you don't really believe, you're you're unworthy you're committing an act you're, you're basically guilty of killing the messiah which is you know you're going to be destroyed so again this doctrine god loves everybody uh the messiah loves everybody god isn't racist holidays are for everyone all of this is completely debunked when you actually read the scriptures the messiah is telling you clearly all israelites are not supposed to partake of the passover because all israelites don't believe man not all israel is of israel man that's plain in the scriptures, all right? There's an elect. There's a, a remnant of Israel that the Lord is dealing with, and he's not dealing with everybody, all right? Two-thirds shall be cut off and die, man. That's in the scriptures, man. So let's prove that the apostles kept the Passover. We're going to start with Apostle Paul. Now, for those who don't know, Apostle Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles, and you have people, modern Christians, they'll try to use and twist and pervert the writings of Apostle Paul to justify this pagan religion known as Christianity which again has absolutely nothing to do with the scriptures. We're going to prove that Apostle Paul did in fact follow the holy days of the scriptures. All right, this is, uh, yeah, while we're in 1 Corinthians, let's start here. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Mashiach, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle, not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye need go out of the world. Right, so... Again, Apostle Paul here is saying, therefore, let us keep the feast. This is after the Messiah was put to death and after he rose, after he walked the earth and ascended up, up unto the Father, the right hand of the Father. Apostle Paul is now teaching the Gentiles, uh, specifically these Gentiles in Corinth, Greece, he's telling them to keep the Passover. So if the Apostle to the Gentiles is telling the Gentiles to keep the Passover, what what excuse do you so-called Christians have for not keeping the Passover? You don't believe. It's simple as that. All right. Now, he stressed the point that you're supposed to uh, undo all the leaven. And he's speaking spiritually. The leaven that's within you, first and foremost, are right, you have to become a new creature. You have to put on as the elect. Or right, you have to put off the old man, as the scriptures say. So 
why would he say that if you're not supposed to keep that like that that doesn't even make any sense okay then he goes on to tell you that leaven is when you invite people that are unworthy different uh just degenerates into the passover he's saying look be holy or right, be separate K keep a division between you and these niggas in so many words man he, he goes on to describe niggas basically now so-called christians will tell you that the apostle to the gentiles did away with this he did they'll take uh They'll take a scripture in Colossians, they'll take scriptures from Galatians, and they'll just try to pervert what Apostle Paul is saying. But they won't read this. He says here clearly, Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So you're supposed to keep the Passover, the feast of unleavened bread, with sincerity and truth, man. That's, that's plain, okay? But let's get another example. This is the book of Acts, chapter 18, verse 21. But bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again if the Most High will. And he sailed from Ephesus. Now, the scriptures doesn't tell you uh, exactly which feast day this is, but when you uh, use process of elimination and deal with Apostle Paul's travels, this is talking about the Passover. And whatever feast day is talking about, it's in Jerusalem. When you read, uh, what is it, Deuteronomy 16 and 16, it tells you there are three feast days that every Israelite male has to return to Jerusalem to keep. Now, we're unable to do that now in our current captivity, but we can uh, keep these feast days spiritually, man. And that's what this is all about. That's what the gospel is about. The Israelites were scattered among all nations. So it's impossible to return unto the Father by keeping the letter of the law perfectly. If you're scattered amongst all nations, how, how is the elect going to return to Jerusalem three times a year until the Messiah comes? That's crazy. There, there, would no, there would be no flesh to be saved, okay? Right now, we're rehearsing the righteous acts, as it tells you in Judges, the fifth chapter, the 11th verse. All right, we're rehearsing the Passover. We rehearse even, um, even the, uh, the Day of Atonement, one of the most important holy days in the scriptures. Yahweh Shai is our atonement, all right? We're technically not keeping the Day of Atonement because he is the atonement for our sins, but we're rehearsing the righteous acts. We're showing that obedience and that, that faith, man. Faith through our works, man. Scriptures tell you faith without works is dead. So what are we doing? We're rehearsing the right... We're showing the Heavenly Father, look, we're, we're doing our best. We're, we're trying. Please send your son back to, to make us perfect, to make us in your image as we were from the beginning. Like Yahweh Shai said, uh, uh, return unto me the glory that I had from the beginning. That's what we all want. We're sons of the Heavenly Father. We're the Israelites. All right. The word Israel, Yashar Allah, He, Prince of God. Okay. That's what that's what we're created to be. And these laws are not a small thing. These laws are our heritage, man. Which, uh, if I if I have time, Lord willing, I'll get to that soon. But um, here you can see Apostle Paul is keeping. Not only is he keeping the feast days, he's also returning to Jerusalem. But this is the apostle to the Gentiles, man. Why is he? If the laws are done away with, if the commandments are done away with, if the holy days are done away with, why is he still going to Jerusalem to observe the holy days in the Book of Exodus, the Book of Leviticus, the Book of Deuteronomy? If those things are done away with, they're, because they're not done away with. All right, you people are demons. This is another example. This is the Book of Acts again. Chapter 20, verse 6, And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and came unto them to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. Right, so Apostle Paul is traveling in different countries and cities, spreading the gospel of Yahweh Shai Mashiach, right, our deliverer. And you can clearly see here, he's celebrating the days of unleavened bread, which coincides with the Passover. The Passover goes into the, the entire week, of unleavened bread where you're not supposed to have leaven in your house or eat things with yeast in them all right so if the if the holy days were done away with why is apostle paul here so fervent in his spirit and adamant about celebrating the days uh the holy days in the book of genesis all the way into the book of of uh, deuteronomy man if these days were done away with all right because they're not done away with again the heavenly father doesn't change he tells you that in malachi 3 verse 6 all right the most high doesn't change so why would his ordinances that he gave his chosen people why would they change if he himself doesn't change all right now if you keep reading this uh acts chapter 20 it tells you in the 16th verse that he celebrated the pentecost which is the feast of weeks it's another mandatory uh holy day where all israelite males are are supposed to go to jerusalem now uh, I think I've proved through the spirit that Apostle Paul kept the Passover. Let's get to some of the other apostles. This is the book of Acts, chapter 12, verse 2. 
and he killed James, the brother of John, that he is talking about Herod, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword, and because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also, right, because our people were wicked at the time, when you, which they're still wicked, they're even more wicked now, but when you go back into the scriptures, uh, back in the time of the disciples, you had the, the ruling oligarch of Israel, the, the Jews in Judea, they were in league with Rome, they were what today would be considered uh, boule niggas or sellout niggas, they, they were comfortable in Rome. They were comfortable being in slavery because they could lord over their own people. They were still being lorded over and ruled by the heathen, but they were cool with that. As long as the heathen give a few puppet Negroes a little bit of power and status, they're completely fine with being in captivity. They're completely fine with their nation being in captivity, as long as they have some type of place at Esau's table. And that's exactly what we see here today with these uh, so-called Christian pastors and these 501c3 Israelite groups, these celebrities, again, the boule, these Negroes, Salaki, these Negroes have absolutely no problem with our people staying at the bottom, our people staying in subjugation to this, this devil, as long as they get a little uh, piece of the pie, so to speak. And the same thing was going on back then. But um, anyway, it says, and because he saw it pleased the Jews, wicked niggers, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread, the holy days we just spoke about. Verse 4, And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison, and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, let's break this all down. For brothers who don't know, a quaternion, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, is a set of four soldiers. Back in Rome, you would have... Um, Basically, when you would apprehend someone, you would have two soldiers in the front and two in the back, or you might throw them in prison and have two two soldiers in the cell and two outside guarding the cell. That's basically how the Romans get down. And our people, because the believers, who again were first called Christians at Antioch, which really they were disciples, they were followers followers of the Messiah, they were uh, the anointed. Our people had a serious problem with the followers of the Messiah, the same way they do today. Because when you're following a man that's telling you that the Roman Empire is going to be destroyed, that you're going to come into power, that you're no longer going to be subject to these heathen, that you're going to be uh, on high, that presents a very serious problem for coons. And the majority of our people then were coons, and the majority are coons today. When you, when you go out on the highways and hedges and you tell Jake that they're a special people, that they're the chosen people of the Heavenly Father, that they're meant to be ruling the earth, that they're not meant to be uh, squalling away in, in slums, that they're supposed to have rulership, crowns on their heads, that they're supposed to be righteous. Our people come against us, man. They don't come against this devil, all right? They don't come against the heathen that are in their communities just siphoning all of the life and resources out of our people. They come against the men that are telling them that they're the holy people, man. And it was the same thing 2,000 years ago. All of the, the disciples and apostles got put to death, man. They were martyrs. Well, most of them, Salakia. Uh, I forget uh, John the Revelator. He he made it to the island of. He was he was still persecuted, but basically, you become a martyr when you profess the word of Yahweh Bashim Yahweh Shai and the true intentions of the Heavenly Father. And you see here, uh, he got delivered. And it says uh, this is the point: intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, did our people celebrate Easter? No. The word the Greek word here is Paskaya, which goes back to the Hebrew word Pasak. That's the Passover, all right? Our people were celebrating the Passover. The, the so-called Jews, which is a byword for, for the kingdom of Judah, as well as the Messiah, uh, the followers of the Messiah, the so-called Christians, all these Israelites were keeping the Passover, man. The Messiah did not do away with the Passover. He enforced it. He, again, we read earlier, he commanded his disciples to keep the Passover until he comes. And until he comes, that blood represents... Uh, it's lucky the wine represents his blood and the bread represents his body man so we see here in the book of acts apostle paul is still keeping the passover he's still keeping the uh the uh the feast of weeks and we see apostle peter here and the rest of the apostles they're still in jerusalem keeping the passover man so what are these modern christians talking about if, a, if the apostle to the gentiles and the the head apostle of the church if they're keeping the passover and they all believe in the messiah why is it people that believe in the Messiah today are telling you that you're not supposed to keep the Passover? That's total madness. All right, now, 
uh, Lord willing, this is all edifying. I want to get to the point about uh, the Passover in itself proves that America is going to be destroyed. That's another main reason that modern day Christians do not celebrate the Passover. You can't celebrate a feast day that's in commemoration of ancient Egypt being utterly destroyed and a, a race of people being delivered out of captivity and then look at the current state of America and say, well, God loves everybody. There's not going to be any judgment for enslaving the Israelites, uh, so-called black and Hispanic people. They, they just need to get over it. If you're celebrating the Passover every year, it's going to be putting your remembrance that the Most High does, in fact, judge nations of people. And the most severe judgment is coming to those people that enslave his chosen people, man. That's plain. When you, every time you celebrate the Passover, you're reminded of what the Heavenly Father's true intentions are. He has a chosen people, and the people that enslave those people are going to get done dirty, man. That's the narrative of the scriptures. That's the narrative of the Passover, and we're going to prove that. Now, when Yahweh Shai said in St. Matthew uh, 26, and also in 1 Corinthians, that the Passover is to be kept until he comes back to establish his kingdom, what does that mean? His kingdom is going to be on earth. His kingdom is going to involve the total destruction of this kingdom. That's how it works. The, the Messiah is not coming back to, to hold an election to become president of America, man. That's not what's going to happen. The Most High is going to completely destroy all of all of the current rulership on the earth. The scriptures tell you Yahweh Shai is going to come with many crowns. What does that mean? All of the so-called heads and rulers of this current world are going to be put in captivity, man. They're going to be put in total subjection. And he's going to share his dominion with his joint heirs. All right, you can read about that in Revelation 2 and start around the 25th verse. But I want to get into this. This is Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 14. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that it shall no more be said, Yahweh liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But Yahweh liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands, whether he hath driven them. And I will bring them again into their land that I gave unto their fathers. Right now, this is talking about how the Passover that we currently keep is going to be replaced with the new Passover in the kingdom. All right, right now, when we keep the Passover, we're, we're still reading the story of Exodus. We're still reading about how our people were delivered out of the hand of Pharaoh. But it tells you in Romans the ninth chapter that Esau is the new Pharaoh. And it tells you in Revelation 11 and 8 and all throughout the book of Isaiah that we would be in a spiritual Egypt. Okay, the children of Yahweh Bashem Shai are in spiritual Egypt right now, and that deliverance out of the spiritual Egypt is going to come with the new Passover. All right, old old Egypt, old Passover, new Egypt, new Passover. It's very simple. That Salaki, that mass deliverance this time around is going to be so epic that the old deliverance that people have been talking about for millennia. All right, people have been talking about the Israelites being brought out of Egypt for literally thousands of years, man. And this new deliverance is gonna be so epic, it's gonna completely eclipse the stories that we read about in Exodus. And side note, for anyone saying that the book of Exodus, uh, the events in that book didn't happen, or the Bible is a fairy tale, or all, all of this madness that, that you hear from atheists and the black conscious community, or just any scoffer, anyone that doesn't believe in the word of the Holy One, you have to ask yourself, was ancient Egypt uh, did it exist? Is it something that's just made up? Did ancient Egypt actually exist? If you answer yes to that question, if you really believe there was an ancient Egypt, uh, an ancient civilization where millions of people lived and there were, there were pyramids and, um, and statues and gold and all of this luxury that these, these Pan-African niggas, these Hotep niggas, they like to go on and on about ancient Egypt. Well, how was ancient Egypt destroyed? If the Bible doesn't contain the accurate destruction of Egypt what book does okay you you clearly had historians back then you had papyruses you had authors writing things down so if the book of Exodus is a fairy tale where is the actual book that documents how millions of people that this society went from ruling the known world to being in utter ruins how, how did that happen if the scriptures are inaccurate where is the accurate description of the fall of Egypt you can't have someone just completely fabricate a story about a place where millions of people were living just just think about that imagine imagine if someone wrote a book saying ancient Rome was destroyed by an alien invasion right now you have actual people that lived in Rome that were uh, documenting the downfall of Rome you have people outside of Rome 
that also documented the fall of Rome. So how could someone just completely fabricate a story about how Rome was destroyed? Millions of people lived there. It was a, it was a, a an empire, man. How do you make up? How do you fabricate the destruction of an empire where, where millions of people are on the, on the earth, man? That's insane. Obviously, the book of Exodus is real. It's true. Okay, it's been accepted as truth for thousands of years. Then all of a sudden, during the Renaissance era. Oh, oh, we can't we can't really trust the Bible anymore. Oh, we, we can't really take that as as a historical account. But meanwhile, all of the nations that were on the earth for thousands of years understood that this actually happened. All right, that's a side note though. But anyway, getting back to the scriptures, this is um, this is the book of Second Ezra, chapter fifteen, and I'm gonna start at verse ten. Behold, my people is led as a flock to the slaughter. I will not suffer them now to dwell in the land of Egypt. But I will bring them with a mighty hand and a stretched out arm and smite Egypt with plagues as before and will destroy all the land thereof. Egypt shall mourn and the foundation of it shall be smitten with the plague and punishment that the Most High shall bring upon it. Right now, when you go into Second Ezra, the 15th and 16th chapter, it outlines the various plagues that new Egypt is going to be hit with. This isn't talking about ancient Egypt. The Israelites are not in slavery in ancient Egypt anymore. All right, this is talking about the spiritual Egypt. This is talking about America. All right, let's just put it plain. When you read the scriptures and you see the Israelites in bondage in Egypt, that's talking about America, all right? Point blank, period. Anyone telling you that, that uh, Babylon is the Vatican or uh, the Egypt in Isaiah is talking about when the 12 tribes, but listen, man, you need to learn from the prophets of Yahweh Bashim Hawashai. All right, that starts with the apostles and elders of Great Millstone, the elders that are under them, the elders that are under them, and the men that, that are laboring and learning from the elders under them. And that's the order. That's the church of Yahweh Shai, man. That's the body, okay? So, basically, the scriptures are telling you that this new Egypt is going to uh, gonna receive plagues, all right, pestilence, race wars, the mark of the beast, which is the implantable RFID chip, also the NFC chip, and 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 so on and so forth man so the lord says what i i will not suffer them to dwell in the land of egypt what happened when the lord told moses look go tell pharaoh let my people go man it was time for us to get out of here there wasn't any debating there wasn't a let's hold a council let's have reparations come on man the most high is about to destroy this place and every time you celebrate the passover you're supposed to be put back into that spirit where you know i'm not supposed to be here I'm in captivity here. I'm not an American. I'm an Israelite in America, okay? I'm in captivity. I'm, I'm about to be loose. Our scriptures tell you that the captain, uh, the captive hasten to be loose, man. And that's the spirit you're in when you celebrate the Passover, which is why modern day Christians cannot celebrate the Passover. It completely contradicts their pagan coon religion known as Christianity, man. You can't celebrate the Passover and then celebrate America at the same time. That doesn't how, how do you celebrate the Passover and then celebrate the 4th of July? How does that work? You're going to celebrate being delivered from America and then celebrate America like that. That's incompatible. The religion of Christianity needs you to not not only not observe the holy days in the scriptures, but to not even think about them. Not, oh, that's in the old time. Don't even don't even read that. Sister, come here. Just just give me your tithes. Just, you know, oh, oh, by the way, lower your panties and everything's going to be OK. That's that's basically the mindset of these pastors, man. Their mind is on on adultery, and and making money off of our people's ignorance, man. Their their mind is not on the kingdom of heaven. Their mind is not on Yahweh Mashiach returning. Their mind is not on the twelve tribes of Israel rising up, man. Their mind is on filthy lucre, and and adultery, man, and idolatry. That's the the state that our people are in right now. Now I want to go into some some actual commandments on how to keep the Passover. This in and of itself is going to show you. That the heavenly father and his word is completely incompatible with christianity this is exodus chapter 12 verse 42 it is a night to be much observed unto yahweh for bringing them out of the land of egypt this is the night of yahweh to be observed of all the children of israel and their generations right first of all the passover is only for israelites so when you read in the scriptures that the messiah and his disciples and his apostles and the followers they all kept the passover if you're reading this and you're not an Israelite, let's say you come across a scripture that says, um, 
a so-called Christian is supposed to keep the Passover. Where do you read about the instructions of the Passover? You have to go back to the book of Exodus, the 12th chapter. And when you read how to keep the Passover, one of the first things you're going to read is that the Passover is for Israelites. Obviously, a celebration of the Most High delivering Israel out of the captivity of the heathen is something that can only be celebrated by an Israelite. So how, how, could, how could the gospel be for everyone? How could, how could the holy days be for everyone when the scriptures are clearly telling you that is for the children of Israel. Let's, uh, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I just want to prove quickly that not only uh, there's two types of strangers. First of all, let's prove that. This is the very next verse. Exodus 12, verse 43. And Yahweh said unto Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof. Now, when you go into this word stranger in Exodus 12 and 43, the word stranger is H, Strong's H5236, which is Nakar. Nakar is a heathen, okay? Nakar is one of the 17 nations outside of the nation of Israel, which is the holy nation, all right? Now, let's see, let's go down a few verses for the sake of brevity. I want to skip to this. This is verse 48. And when a stranger, when a stranger shall sojourn with thee and will keep the Passover to Yahweh, let all his males be circumcised and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. One law shall be to him that is homeborn, and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. One law, right. Now, when you go into this word stranger here in verse 48, it's not the same stranger. It's not Nakar, which is in verse 43. All right, the word stranger in verse 48 is Strong's H1616, which is Gar. A Gar is basically a traveler, a sojourner. All right, a Gar is someone that in this context is an Israelite that's born outside of the land of Israel. So it's telling you in the, in the instructions that no stranger can partake of the Passover. And then a few verses down, it tells you that a stranger can keep the Passover if he's circumcised. What does that mean? The stranger that can't keep the Passover is a Nakar, which is a heathen. And the stranger that can keep the Passover is a Gar, is an Israelite foreigner. And right now we're all Gars, all right? We're all, we're all Israelite foreigners. Every Israelite in America or who's scattered across the four winds of the earth that wakes up to the fact that we're an Israelite. We're all sojourners, all right? We're not born in the Holy Land. We're not born keeping the commandments. We're not born uh, at a place where we could travel back to Jerusalem three times a year. This scripture is talking about us, man, through the spirit, man. Right now, we're in that time where the elect is being gathered by the word of the Holy One. But I just wanted to, to bring this out to show you that any sane person that reads the scriptures that decides, well, wait a minute, what these Israelites are saying is true. We are supposed to keep the commandments. Okay, we are supposed to keep the holy days. We're not supposed to celebrate Christmas and Easter and Valentine's Day and the 4th of July. We're supposed to, if I if I believe in the Messiah, I'm supposed to keep the holy days in the scriptures. So what happens when you do that? When you read how to keep the Passover, the first thing you're going to read is that the heathen can't keep the Passover. So what is that? If the disciples of the Messiah have to keep the commandments, and keep the holy days and the holy days are only for israelites the gospel is only for israelites salvation is only for israelites the passover the new passover when the messiah makes his second coming it's only for the israelites man just like the first passover man that this is plain okay so i want to close with this uh this psalms right here the book of psalms chapter 136 verse 10 to him that smote egypt in their firstborn for his mercy endureth forever. Now, here we see the Heavenly Father's mercy being brought up immediately following the fact that he killed the firstborn of the Egyptians, man. The destruction of the heathen and the mercy of the Heavenly Father are mentioned in the same scripture. Why is that? Because who is the mercy of the Heavenly Father for? All right, Isaiah, the 14th chapter. He, he showeth mercy unto Jacob and will yet choose Israel, man. The mercy of Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shai is for Jacob, all right? It's for Israel. He's going to set us in our own land, man. That's that's who the mercy is for. It's not for everyone. It's not for everyone on the planet Earth. It's, it's damn sure not for the Egyptians and their firstborn. Let me read that again. To him that smote Egypt in their firstborn, for his mercy endureth forever, and brought out Israel from among them, for his mercy endureth forever, with a strong hand and with a stretched out arm, for his mercy endureth forever. Let me jump down to verse 17. To him which smote great kings, for his mercy endureth forever, and slew famous kings, 
for his mercy endureth forever. Right, the Most High puts a heathen into power and he kills him, man. That's how he gets down. And slew famous kings for his mercy endureth forever. Right, here we see the Heavenly Father killing kings that rule over the Israelites. That's counted as mercy unto us, man. The Most High does not love everyone. All right, the narrative of Christianity is not biblical. The mercy of Jacob the mercy of Israel comes with the destruction of the heathen that are ruling over Israel. That's that's all throughout the scriptures, man. Let me read a couple more. Uh, verse 21. And gave their land for an heritage, for his mercy endureth forever. Even an heritage unto Israel, his servant, for his mercy endureth forever. Who remembered us in our low estate, for his mercy endureth forever. And hath redeemed us from our enemies. For his mercy endureth forever. Right. The mercy of the Heavenly Father includes redeeming his chosen people from our enemies, not with our enemies. All right. You could read that in uh, St. Luke, the first chapter. You could start at the 68th verse and read to about the 75th verse. It explains to you in the Gospels directly what salvation is. All right. We're going to be delivered from the hand of those that hate us. We're going to be delivered from our enemies, man. That's all throughout the scriptures, man. So. Lord willing, this lesson was edifying. Uh, you know, why don't Christians celebrate the Passover? Really, why can't they celebrate the Passover? Because the Passover in and of itself completely demolishes the core tenets of Christianity, man. The Heavenly Father is in fact racist. His son is also racist, all right? The Most High judges nations of people, not just individuals, all right? The, the America's gonna be destroyed. All of this is, is critical in keeping this holy day, man, which is why they can't keep it, because really they're heathen. Even the Israelites, uh, you people of so-called Negro and native Indian descent, those of you who are Israelites by blood, you're counted as heathen by the Heavenly Father because you, you're not even, you're not worthy to be called an Israelite. You're an American, okay? You're a Jamaican, you're a Haitian, you're a Cuban, you're a Puerto Rican, you're a Mexican, you're El Salvadorian, you, you're Canadian, you're British, you're, you're this, you're that, you're African, all right? You niggas are not worthy of being called Israelites because you are not looking forward to being uh, delivered from the hand of your enemy. You you love being in slavery. You love the heathen. You love these Edomites, especially, all right? And the other nations, man. You don't love Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shai. You don't love the Heavenly Father. You don't love his word. You don't love his prophecies. You don't love his promises. You don't. You definitely don't love his commandments. You don't love his uh, his prophets, his men that are telling you that you're the greatest people, that you need to repent and take part in this holy covenant, man. You you don't have the love. The love of the Father is not in you, so you're going to be destroyed. But for the elect, the hopeful elect, all you Akim, man, particularly you Akim in, in Louisiana, man, Shalom to you Akim. It was a beautiful service. And, um, you know, uh, normally when you, when you, uh, when you have a, a holy day that's beautiful, you might say, well, I hope to see you next year, brother. I hope to, you know, but... Really, this is the Passover. This is one of the only holidays where you hope every single time that you celebrate it that it's the last time that you're going to celebrate it. All right. So I hope that, you know, I hope to celebrate the Passover in the kingdom with you, Akim. But I, I'm not looking forward to being here another year. I'm not looking forward to America existing in 2020, 2021. Um, I don't I don't wish for, for more Passovers in Babylon. All right. I look forward to celebrating with you, Akim, in the kingdom of heaven, man. So Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shai Barak Atham. All right. So with that, I want to give all praises, honor, and glory to Yahweh Bahashem Yahweh Shai Bahashem Rachakudash. Double honest to the apostles and elders of Great Millstone and Shalom to all you Akim, man. Ababa Ball.